Hi Founder fans, Jason here. Welcome to Founder of the Day Weekly Wrap-Up. I'll sit like this for a minute so I'm in the middle of the screen. Uh, we are about to discuss the last seven founders written about on founderoftheday.com and videos released every morning right here on Founder of the Day. Uh, if you did not learn enough, hopefully we go through them this time, learn a little more. As always, feel free to ask questions. Uh, and uh, let's get it going because I don't want to have to lean over to be in the middle anymore. So I'm going to pop up the first founder here. There we go. And now it's normal. That's why I'm off to the side. Um, federal Farmer number nine. So we've been discussing each Friday, Federalist Fridays, the Federal Farmer papers. Uh, uh, federal Farmer is, of course, an anti-Federalist author, uh, anonymous person. We're not sure who it is. For a long time, it was believed to be Richard Henry Lee, but now it is believed to be Melanchthon Smith based on a variety of tests and, and analytics, um, including computer analytics. Uh, so let's talk about it. Uh, Federal Farmer number uh, came out January 4th, 1788. Uh, at this point, the Federalist Papers themselves, the actual Federalists, have been coming out. And uh, Federal Farmer in this focuses on the different types of politicians there are and how increasing the number of members of the federal government would increase the likelihood of better quality people running the United States. Uh, so let's get into it and pull my mic a little closer. First of all, uh, the three types of politicians as he sees it. The first is the natural aristocracy. And we hear the uh, American founders talking about the natural aristocracy often. When they say this, they essentially mean the elites. They assume that people based on family and birth and the acclimation of wealth, certain people will rise to the top. Though that being said, I, I want to go back real quick. I do have a quote I pulled from this, which I think is really funny. Uh, speaking of rise to the top, it says, uh, when the political pot boils, the scum will often get uppermost and make its appearance. So <laughs> that is what the federal farmer is referencing in this particular uh, anti-federalist paper. Again, versus the natural aristocracy, they just assume that in any society, certain people will become uh, uh, wealthier, fix my hair, uh, wealthier, more powerful. It's just going to happen. And they do deserve a place in society. As we discussed last week, uh, when the federal farmer was talking about the uh, House of Commons and the House of Lords in England, how nobility actually helps separate the elite from the commoners. And therefore, they don't let the elite in the House of Commons. Um, he also talks about another powerful type of person, uh, what he calls, quote, popular demagogues. Uh, essentially, people who rise to power more on their character and wit than on any wealth or, or real uh, uh, ability to lead. Uh, these people, as the word demagogues might indicate, he sees as the sneakier sort who are able to use their oratory and their power to convince people and their charm and charisma to exceed their position and take the lead. He then talks about a third group that he doesn't give a particular name, but he calls, quote, uh, the, quote, substantial and respectable part of the democracy who are often overlooked. And these people are, he says, usually find a place in local government, but they don't have the wealth or power to, or necessarily the charisma to make their way up to the federal government. But that doesn't mean they're not deserving. And in fact, some of the most deserving people to be leaders in the federal government will never have a chance because the way he sees the United States Constitution set up. Uh, he then goes on to repeat an old argument of his, which is grow the government, add more delegates. There is not enough representatives in the House of Representatives. Uh, many Federalists would argue too many people will make it too hard to get anything done. But the uh, federal farmer actually argues that the more people there, the more diluted the power is, and therefore it's less likely that either the natural aristocracy, who should be in the United States Senate anyway, or those popular demagogues, uh, it's less likely that either of those groups will actually try and be in the House of Representatives because there'll be so little power per delegate. But because of this, it will open up spaces for these other representatives, these, these lower level intelligent minds that don't have the opportunity to excel. Furthermore, adding more positions means there's more representatives per voter, which means more representatives, which means more of a chance that these people who should be our leaders are our leaders. So that's a brief review of Federal Farmer number the ninth. We're going to move right along from it. Uh, I'm going to accidentally put that up and then come over here and put up Nathaniel Gorham, who uh, we are moving on to. Now, Nathaniel Gorham is a huge, huge founder. Uh, he, by the time... Uh, Oh, oh, press the wrong button, wrong button. What am I doing here? 
What am I doing? Uh, Nathaniel Gorham is from Massachusetts. Uh, throughout the Revolutionary War, he's making his way up in state politics and really impresses a lot of his co-workers. Eventually, he's sent to the Continental Congress, and he's even selected as president of the Continental Congress for a time. Now, uh, interestingly enough, Nathaniel Gorham was one of the people who realized there were problems with the Articles of Confederation, and he did something that we found out decades later he actually did. It was questionable whether or not he did it, or anyone did it, until decades later when the letter was found. Uh, before I tell you what he did, please don't judge him. He ends up being an important person on creating the United States Constitution. Uh, and I also need to note that monarchy was extremely popular at the time. Most Western powers were monarchies. Constitutional monarchies, sure, but monarchies nonetheless. And as the Articles of Confederation was unraveling, some people said, well, maybe monarchy wasn't so bad. Nathaniel Gorham is one of these people, and in fact, as president of the Continental Congress, Nathaniel Gorham wrote to Prince Henry of Prussia. He is the younger brother of uh, Frederick the Great, who was a contemporary of the American founders. I always like to remind people that between Frederick the Great and uh, uh, Catherine the Great, those two greats were both contemporaries of the American revolutionaries. Um, uh, hopefully there's not too much buffering. YouTube is telling me there's a little bit of a problem. Hopefully not too much buffering. Anyway, uh, Nathaniel Gorham writes to Prince Henry, the younger brother of Frederick the Great, and says, Hey man, how would you like to be king of the United States? And, well, King Henry writes back, or Prince Henry writes back and says, I, I don't want to be king of the United States. I'm busy over here. Uh, which is probably for the best that we did not get a King Henry. Now, Nathaniel Gorham didn't act alone. There were actually several people uh, involved in this uh, trying to see if there was a monarch that wanted to be King of the United States. He ends up not, as I said, uh, and Nathaniel Gorham, just a year later, is then elected to the Constitutional Convention. And he goes to the Constitutional Convention. Now, I apologize. Yeah, people are bailing because it seems that our, we are not... YouTube is not receiving enough video to maintain smooth streaming. Huh. Stream status poor. Why? I don't, I haven't done anything different than I've ever done before. My internet looks fine. I uh, don't know why. Um, yep. And so, and everyone left. Okay, great. Let me see. Let me see. What? I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. Excellent condition. Am I live? I can't tell. I did pause it. I did try and redo it. Anyone popping in now? We had some problems with our live feed. I think I fixed it. I apologize for any frozen screens. Uh, everyone popping in now, uh, I, it looks like I fixed it. Hopefully I fixed it for whatever reason. Despite doing everything the way I always do it, YouTube said I was having a little bit of a connection problem, not getting enough videos. Hopefully I'm not choppy. Hopefully I sound good because that's the most important part. Anyway, let's keep talking about Nathaniel Gorham. So Nathaniel Gorham tried to get Prince uh, Henry of Prussia. Awesome. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, I guess sometimes you just have to unplug it and plug it back in, <laughs> which is essentially what I did. Um, cross my fingers, it stays that way. Because I do want to do the rest, after this, I do want to do the rest of our read-along that we started yesterday. So, Gorham tries to get a king, doesn't happen, and then he's elected to the Constitutional Convention. When he gets to the Constitutional Convention, Nathaniel Gorham is, the first thing they do at the Constitutional Convention is choose a president of the convention. <sighs> Darn it. I'm not sure, I have no idea why we're experiencing difficulties. Um, anyway, uh, he does... I'm really distracted now, and I shouldn't be, because I, I want you guys to have a quality viewing of this episode. I don't know why it's giving us trouble. Oh, um, no. Okay. Uh, Ashley, let me know if it goes wrong again, please, because I, I just kind of watching myself over here, and it's distracting. Anyway, uh, Gorham goes to the, the Constitutional Convention. At the Constitutional Convention, the first thing they do is that they elect a president, and that's George Washington. Everyone knows that, but the second thing they do is they, they decide on operations of this particular convention and they choose to use a parliamentary procedure that they've always used in most places and they still use called the committee of the whole 
Committee of the Whole, the idea is most uh, most bodies use committees. Uh, okay, sorry. Seems to be good right now. Okay, thanks, Ashley. So uh, most Congresses use committees. And a committee is you take a few people and say, go over there and solve this problem. Come back and tell us what you think we should do. And the Committee of the Whole says, okay, we're going to take every single person in Congress and make them all a separate committee. We're going to meet in the same place because we're all already here. But the point is, in the Committee of the Whole, nothing is official. So if we're here having a conversation, I can float an idea. And if everyone boos me down, I can, well, oh, sorry, guys, never mind. Don't worry about it. And that way, it's never put on the permanent record, so to speak. So uh, that's why they use the Committee of the Whole. And what they did, they couldn't have Washington be the chairman of the Committee of the Whole. That's just the convention. So they elected a chairman of the Committee of the Whole, and they chose Nathaniel Gorm. And for the first month of the co uh, Constitutional Convention, Nathaniel Gorham would get up, I'm sorry, George Washington would get up, gavel the convention into session, and then immediately go to the Committee of the Whole. And he would step down from the chair, and Nathaniel Gorham would sit in George Washington's seat. And Nathaniel Gorham spent over the first month, and pretty frequently thereafter, taking over the Constitutional Convention, overseeing the debates. And again, these are the debates that are not on the record. So people are not only saying things that they might not otherwise say for ideas, but they are talking to each other in less professional manner than you might expect in the actual Constitutional Convention. So Nathaniel Gorham basically gets the hard part of George Washington's job at the Constitutional Convention. On several occasions, he uh, calls it for the day just in the nick of time before the convention falls apart. Uh, he would oversee debates. He'd make sure the appropriate people were picked at the appropriate times to speak, giving fair assessments to the different states that are represented, uh, the different sections and ideas that are being, you know, the big states versus the small states. His role in overseeing a gigantic part of the Constitutional Convention is impossible to overlook. Well, no, people overlook it all the time. Uh, impossible to overstate. He is just that important an American founder. Um, and he would go on, I, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking a little bit now. He would basically go back to Massachusetts for the remainder of his career. A uh, really, really interesting character. Why don't we move on to someone else from the Constitutional Convention? Well, uh, Nathaniel Gorham was big at the first half of the Constitutional Convention. David Brearley was big at the very tippy toe end. Uh, David Brearley was from New Jersey. He joined the New Jersey militia. He served for several years with the Continental Army and left only because he was selected as Chief Justice of the New Jersey Supreme Court. Not really a position you could turn down for being a lower level officer. Uh, interesting, enough, of all the cases he covered, the one I ran into was one called uh, Holmes v. Walton, which basically overturned an act of the New Jersey legislature, which was one of the first times you see judicial review being used in the United States. Now, judicial review is just what I said. When the a, a, a justice department, a Supreme Court decides that a law made by the same state or government's uh, legislature is unconstitutional and therefore it nullifies the law. Now, this would be important later. We would see uh, eventually under the U.S. Constitution, uh, the case of Marbury versus Madison is important because John Marshall basically gives himself the right of judicial review, but it wasn't unprecedented. Judicial review had happened uh, in uh, uh, several states beforehand and in Great Britain. Uh, and David Brearley is the one who really brought it to New Jersey. So, uh, because of his legal status, he is selected by Jersey to go to the Constitutional Convention. While he's there, he doesn't really speak very often. He's just kind of there listening. Uh, but he acts on several committees. And the most important committee is the Committee of Postponed Parts. Committee of Postponed Parts, also called the Brearley Committee, and also called the Third Committee of Eleven, was a group of 11 members of the Constitutional Convention who all stepped aside uh, and said they were given all the postponed parts. Now, what are postponed parts? Postponed parts are the things that they couldn't figure out when Nathaniel Gorham was in charge, letting everyone yell at each other. Uh, all the things that were too tough for the convention to figure out, they gave to this committee. This committee assembled on, I believe it was August 31st, and were done by September 12th. And they went through and came to conclusions on 
all the different things that the Constitutional Convention couldn't do as a larger body. Uh, so things like the Electoral College, uh, the Office of the Vice President and its responsibilities, copyright and patent regulation, uh, they shortened the presidency from seven years to four years. Um, they gave the Senate the ability to uh, certain executive branch, traditionally executive branch uh, tasks, which later the Anti-Federalists would be mad about, uh, but the power to declare war and choose ambassadors and the power to raise and support armies. This was all given to the United States Senate and written into the Constitution because of the Brearley Committee. So again, another person who's like, no one knows this name, but his efforts at the in the last two weeks of the Constitutional Convention made the United States Constitution. All right, and we're we'll running through it, cooking with gas here. Um, who's next? Caleb Gibbs. Caleb Gibbs. Caleb Gibbs was uh, from Massachusetts. Uh, when George Washington shows up in Boston, Gibbs joins the army. Um, uh, I don't recall the first time he met Washington, but uh, Gibbs is actually brought into the Continental Army. He is given the position. He's essentially made an aide de camp to George Washington, one of the many people to do so. And he is put in charge of Washington's lifeguards. Now, the lifeguards were, again, streaming problems. I don't know. Uh, Washington's lifeguards were essentially the Secret Service. They were there to protect Washington. And his belongings. They chose where Washington got to camp. They guarded Washington while he slept. They also guarded the Continental Army's belongings, including all the money. All the money, the little bit of all the money that the Continental Congress sent to George Washington, Caleb Gibbs was in charge of defending. Uh, Gibbs actually, uh, it's interesting because when they were looking for a person to take over this position, I have a few quotes from Washington and what he was looking for in a soldier. Uh, quote, sobriety, honesty, and good behavior. And then I have another quote. There is nothing more desirable than cleanliness in a soldier. Thank you, George Washington. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Uh, he wanted someone with hygiene, which clearly Gibbs had. Um, so Gibbs was a major when he held this position. Unfortunately, despite being part of Washington's family, that inner circle that they called the family, uh, with the likes of Hamilton and and. John Lawrence, uh, Lafayette, uh, Gibbs, though, being a little older than those gentlemen, he's a major, but then the Continental Army is reorganized. And when that reorganization happens, he would have gotten a demotion to stay as commander of the lifeguards. So what he actually does, he resigns that permission position, but he does stay with the Continental Army. And he's actually with the Continental Army through the Battle of Yorktown. So he serves all eight years of the war. Uh, interestingly enough, afterward, he goes back to Massachusetts for a while, but then he is given uh, the position of, uh, um, he, he is put in charge of Charlestown, Charleston Naval Yard, where he is there overseeing the construction of some of America's first ships, specifically Navy ships. This includes the USS Constitution, which is one of the most famous American ships of all time. Uh, Caleb Gibbs oversaw the construction of that. Uh, and that's a brief overview of Gibbs. We're running through it a little fast. I am very distracted by the, the poor quality that's apparently coming through, which I apologize for. YouTube. Uh, and we're also going to do that live read-along afterwards. So maybe maybe I'm, I'm, I'm going a little faster than normal, but that's okay. Uh, so that's Caleb Gibbs. We're going to move on to Richard Carey, who's fascinating. So Richard Carey is one of he ends up becoming an aide-de-camp to George Washington. And you would think every aide-de-camp to George Washington would have a Wikipedia page at least. No, not Richard Carey. Believe it or not, there's about 32 people who serve as aide-de-camp during the Revolutionary War to General Washington himself. 32 people who took to the field with Washington, would write letters on his behalf, would take his orders across the field, dodging bullets and gunfire to make sure the other generals knew what Washington wanted. Carrie was one of these people. He doesn't even get a Wikipedia page. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I won't harp on it. Uh, thing is, Carrie was born to a really well... He also is pretty hard to find information on him, so I'm pretty proud of this particular article. Uh, but Carrie 
Uh, he's from Massachusetts from a wealthy merchant family, and he's, he goes to Harvard. And then after that, he takes a trip throughout the British colonies in North America, trying to drum up business for his family. And while he's doing that, he, that's when he first meets George Washington on his trip south. Now, not long after this, he returns to Boston, and that's when hostilities break out. Uh, he, Carey actually stays in town longer than most patriots. He stays till the last very minute until it's like, okay, I'm going to get arrested. And then he runs out. Um, he joins like Caleb Gibbs, George Washington's family and becomes part one of the aides de camp. This is actually based on a recommendation John Adams made to the Continental Congress. John Adams is a member of the Continental Congress and says, I think Richard Carey would be a great major. He gets that position and then George Washington falls in love with him real quick. And he joins Washington as an aide-de-camp. Now, the most interesting thing that Richard Carey does is he escorts uh, Mrs. Washington, as it says next to me. Now, it's him and Robert Hanson Harrison, who is our next founder, so I'm not going to talk about him too much. But they take Mrs. Washington from Boston to New York City when the Continental Army travels. But they take a different route. It's really interesting to me that they decide that it will be safer to take a longer, different route with just a few people guarding Mrs. Washington to New York, then for it to travel with the Continental Army. The assumption must be the Continental Army would get attacked, but the British were waiting outside New York. They're not going to attack the entire Continental Army, and if they do, Martha Washington would be safer behind the Continental Army, one would presume. That's not what happens. Uh, they bring her there and safely does it. Uh, they say they safely get her there, both her and Richard Park Custis, George Washington's stepson. Uh, now, Carrie only serves from about June of 76 until the following December when he resigns his command. Now, it's it, he ostensibly resigns for to get married. He does go get married. But he, that's a pretty short time to be in the army, especially for an aide de camp. Though this doesn't end his service. So Richard goes, he leaves the country and goes to St. Croix, or Croy, don't know how it's pronounced, uh, in the Caribbean where Alexander Hamilton was from. While he's there... He starts a new merchant firm, and their business is smuggling goods. Uh, the British Navy had uh, barricaded the entire eastern seaboard of the United States. They were just not letting anyone in to come sell their wares. So there they are, <laughs> not letting people in. Richard Carey uses his new merchant business to smuggle goods and, and run the gauntlet. He runs the British barricade and gets to the line and sells products to the United States. So this is very lucrative for him. He makes a whole lot of money. But at the same time, he's not bringing things to the Continental Army like we might expect. He's actually bringing things and selling them to the general public. Uh, again, this might sound pretty selfish, but because of first the boycott against British goods and then the war itself, during which time they still boycotted British goods, there was a huge gap in things being brought into the United States. Products, everyday items people needed, were just not available to everyday people. So Richard Carey's work running the, the, the blockade, not barricade, blockade of the British and getting these goods to the people as selfish and profitable as it might be, it was actually really, really important to the people of the United States to get these products. Um, afterward, Carey decides to start a new business and he relocates to upstate New York where he starts a, uh, a a mill. So most places around the frontier, the, the close frontier, New York, Kentucky, uh, uh, Western Virginia, Western Pennsylvania, most of the towns there were started with, uh, people would go out there to farm, but someone would start a grist mill and a sawmill because uh, you needed those things to build houses and to grind your grain and to sell it, to sell it. So he went up there thinking, I'm going to start a mill and make a whole lot of money. This doesn't go well. And despite the earlier profits he had, uh, he goes up and uh, pretty quickly has to declare bankruptcy, which is not great. Uh, and he lives the rest of his life in relative modesty compared to the wealth he once accumulated. Uh, and then when he passed away, he actually passed away and he's buried in Cooperstown, not far from the National Baseball Hall of Fame. For those of you who are also interested in baseball history, there's a little extra for you. <laughs> so that is Richard Carey. Let's bounce over. Again, I apologize if my stream is not smooth. For whatever reason, YouTube is saying I'm not giving a great stream. Don't know why. Uh, everything I'm doing usually works. Uh, and we're going to move on to Richard Hanson Harrison. Now, again, another aide de camp. This is three in a row aides de camp to George Washington. It just happened by mistake. But this one is one of the most important. Arguably, 
arguably the most underappreciated aide-de-camp in the Revolutionary War. The play Hamilton, the musical Hamilton, says that Alexander Hamilton is George Washington's right-hand man. And while Hamilton was certainly important to George Washington throughout his life, during the Revolutionary War, George Washington's right-hand man was Robert Hanson Harrison. And that is hard to argue. Now, Harrison was from Maryland, though he had moved to Fredericksburg, Virginia after he got his law degree, and that's where, as we've discussed not too long ago, George Washington's mom lived, and his sister, so uh, he became friendly at that point with George Washington, and actually did some legal work for Washington. Then Washington goes off and becomes commander-in-chief, and Harrison, he wants to join the war too. He ends up pretty quickly being appointed as George Washington's military secretary. In this position, he was essentially George Washington's chief of staff. Now, chief of staff was not a phrase they had back then. That's a modern term. But what he did mirrors what a modern-day president's chief of staff would do. He ran the organization. George Washington said, I need this done. And he would go do it. Hansen would take his notes. He would write his letters. Uh, he, would, he would tell everyone. He would hand out the general orders to people. Uh, David, thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it. Sorry we're having a little bit of problems apparently today with YouTube. I really appreciate it. Uh, but yeah, thank you for coming. I'm glad you found the David Cobb one. Actually, while doing this article today on Richard, uh, or yesterday on Richard Hanson Harrison, I actually thought about redoing David Cobb, your ancestor. Uh, but you kind of called me out on that, so I don't know if I can. Uh, now there's no data. Hopefully the stream is working. It's hard to tell. Anyway, Robert Hanson Harrison acts for five years as George Washington's chief of staff, essentially. That's not the official title, that's just what he's doing. He is the, the, the commander-in-chief secretary. While doing this, like I said, he ends up being in charge of just all the correspondence. Uh, he is next to George Washington during every battle. He's the one there next to Washington during every battle for the first five years of the war. Uh, he also is with Alexander Hamilton in charge of exchanging prisoners of war for quite some time, which is a really important job. Now, unfortunately for Harrison, his father passes away. Uh, and this leaves his family in a little bit of financial turmoil. He also, at this point, he's only in his, he's only about 30 years old and has already outlived two wives. And he has several daughters at home. And now that his father passed away, he needs to go home to take care of his family. It, it's just a fact. He had served for five years. Now, the Continental Army's loss is Maryland's gain because less than a month after he gets home to Maryland, he's named Chief Justice of Maryland Supreme Court. They're like, welcome home, judge our laws. <laughs> and he does just that. Thank you guys for, for confirming that it looks it looks good. Uh, for whatever reason, YouTube keeps telling me things are a problem. I don't know. Okay, so he goes home, he spends almost a decade in Maryland as Chief Justice. Then the United States Constitution is written, and it's time to choose a president of the United States. You might not be surprised to learn that George Washington wins. Now, at this point, every elector cast two votes for president. Whoever got the first mount was president, whoever got the second was vice president. But everyone cast two votes for president. George Washington, I think there were 68 electors that first time. Uh, George Washington got all 68 and was unanimously elected. After that was John Adams, then John Jay, and then Robert Hanson Harrison got the fourth most votes to be the first president of the United States. Now, everyone knew it was George Washington. That's why he was unanimously elected. Everyone gave one vote to him. And to be honest, uh, John Adams got 34 compared to John Jay's nine and Robert Hanson Harrison's six. So Adams, even in the vice presidential running, absolutely dominated Harrison. But it is extraordinarily important to note that this man, his work, not just in the Maryland Supreme Court, but as Washington's aide during the war, was of such note in his own time that six people of the 68 chosen to be electors in that first election thought, hey, he's Washington's right-hand man. He should be vice president of the United States. He doesn't win, but George Washington very quickly chooses people to be on the Supreme Court. And this guy's been on the Maryland Supreme Court for about a decade, and he said he chooses Harrison. And it goes to the Senate, and he's confirmed, overwhelmingly confirmed as an inaugural member 
of the United States Supreme Court. But Harrison's been sickly for years. In fact, even during the war, I read uh, Tench Tillman complaining that sometimes he had to pick up Harrison's slack because Harrison could like fall very ill at times. And Harrison decides... I can't, I can't do it. I'm too sick. He's just 45 years old at this point, but he's like, I'm too sick. I can't. And several people convinced George Washington to write to Harrison directly. Again, Harrison years ago had been his personal lawyer. He writes to him directly, which is not something George Washington did, and essentially begs him, come on, I need you to come work with John Jay and be on the United States Supreme Court. And Harrison says, okay, fine. And he gets in his horse and buggy and he starts riding north and he makes it like a few miles and says, I can't, and goes back and then turns it down. And then just a few months later, about four months later, dies at 45 years old. Now, we're not sure what the illness was that killed him, but, and I could only speculate, but as I said, it had been lingering for a long time. I would probably think tuberculosis because it had been affecting him for so long. And it's a sad ending to one of the most important founders, one of the most important sidekicks George Washington had in his life. I know that's saying a lot because there are, there are a ton of sites. Hamilton, Lafayette, uh, Lawrence gets a lot of credit nowadays, though he's not quite a Hamilton or Lafayette or Harrison. Um, later on, uh, uh, who's looming? Uh, uh, Tobias Lear, one of his personal secretaries. Uh, he, a lot of people helped Washington along the way, but Robert Hanson Harrison is a name you just don't ever hear anymore, despite the fact that, I mean, he was at Washington's side, literally, for every battle. Not just at the battle, literally at his side. So that's the story of Robert Hanson Harrison. Uh, if you guys have questions, let me know. Kind of blasting through. Uh, we're up to our last founder today. In our week in review, for those of you who are new, do this every week. Uh, every single day of the week, I publish an article and a video uh, about the American Revolution. Different founder, usually, except Fridays, our Anti-Federalist Fridays. Used to be Federalist Fridays, but we got through those. So now we're doing the Anti-Federalists. Uh, and this particular video is a wrap-up of that week. So thank you guys for coming. Uh, I'm going to do this. I will also note, we started something new yesterday, a read-along. Uh, I'm about, probably about half an hour after we do this. I'm going to take a little break fix up some of my stuff here, see if I can fix the problem with YouTube. Turn my AC on for a few minutes because it gets hot, <laughs> but it's too loud when I'm doing the videos. Uh, we're going to finish reading William Pierce's review uh, character sketches of delegates to the Constitutional Convention. So we're going to do the second half of that uh, a little bit later tonight. So if you're interested, uh, like and subscribe. <laughs> That's the way you know when I go live. Hit the notification bell is the only way you'll know when I go live because YouTube's tricky. And we're talking about William Woodford. Now, I'll be honest, uh, a few years ago, I started Founder of the Day about three and a half years ago. Before that, I was never really into military history. However, I have made very much of an effort to catch up over the last several years. I feel like I've done a pretty good job. Uh, and so therefore, I'm always nervous talking about battles because I know military historians would be like, well, no, they come from this flank and, and they, you know, like, so I don't want to say the wrong thing. <laughs> I feel the way about military history is I do a little bit about religion. I'm not an expert on it. And while there are other things I talk about, I'm not an expert on. I'm, I'm, those are two things that if you're not an expert, people call you out real quick. <laughs> um, anyway, William Woodford. William Woodford was born in Virginia. Uh, as a young man, uh, about 21 years old, the French and Indian War breaks out. And he was already serving in the militia. He was from a fairly wealthy family, kind of a middling family. He goes and joins the fight in the French and Indian War. He serves under General, oh, I'm sorry, Colonel George Washington. About 20 years before he was a general. Uh, he also makes friends with several other people. Uh, Adam Stevens, uh, names are escaping me, but several important future founders are all fighting uh, in Virginia during the French and Indian War. He fights there, makes some appropriate friends. And then in 1775, Lexington and Concord breaks out. Now at this time, William Woodford had joined the government and he was part of the Third Virginia Convention. Uh, as you probably know, when uh, leading up to the Revolutionary War, the colonial assemblies were criticizing the government so many royal governors dissolved the colonial assemblies and said go home we're a dictatorship now so those colonial assemblies generally just went to a different building and met anyway some called themselves assemblies some called themselves provincial governments some called themselves committees and some called themselves conventions and virginia called itself a convention they had five of these conventions maybe maybe six but usually the number is five because the sixth one turns into the actual state government 
So uh, they have these conventions. Uh, he is at William Woodford is at the third Virginia convention. And while at the third Virginia convention, well, Lord Govern, good Lord Dunmore, the royal governor, uh, he started to run away, and Lexington and Concord broke out. So there's a war now. So we need people in charge of the militia. And since George Washington was headed north, as were many of the best generals in Virginia, were headed north to join the Continental Army, William Woodford was chosen as a colonel in the state militia. And they said, hey, go to Newburgh, I'm sorry, Newport, and go, uh, let's try this again, go to Nor Norfolk, Virginia, and uh, get rid of the former royal governor for us. Uh, and Colonel Woodford says, okay, and he takes about 400 men to Great Bridge, which is just a little bit of south of Norfolk. Now, Norfolk at the time was the biggest city in Virginia. Uh, the royal governor had lit a bunch of fires there, burned down some Patriot homes, and ran away, and was on the other side of Great Bridge waiting for reinforcements. William Woodford comes to the west side of Great Bridge with his men, and he has about 400 uh, uh, I think it's about, I, I think, I believe the numbers were 400 uh, uh, militiamen and 100 riflemen, which is important. Uh, the, on the east side is Dunmore with his men. He's waiting for reinforcements also. Now they get their lines a little bit crossed because they're camped on opposite sides of the bridge and no one's ready to attack yet. Uh, it turns out Dunmore hears a rumor that Woodford just got some cannons because some North Carolinians came up. And that's true. What Dunmore didn't know is that those North Carolinians didn't have all the necessarily all the necessary surprise supplies to actually fire those cannons. Uh, at the same note, uh, William Woodford heard that some Scots, uh, some little Scots Irish uh, men had arrived to fight on Dunmore's side. This was also kind of true, except those men were families with mostly women and children, who at the time weren't fighting. Uh, and the men who did arrive generally weren't trained in warfare, not to fight alongside the British army. So, both sides thought the other side had more power than the, they actually did. To be fair, over the course of the days that they're waiting there, Woodford gets more and more reinforcements. Like I said, North Carolina shows up with not just gun, uh, cannons, but men and guns. And they are their numbers swell to about a thousand. Eventually, Dunmore gets brave enough to launch an attack. He sends some men down and around to come up, on the on the west side of the river at Woodford, uh, and then at the same time they cross and they start running across the bridge to attack the fortifications that they had dug there. This is a terrible idea because Woodford just blasts everyone away from the fortifications. I mean, you send him men across the bridge, uh, and he's just blasting them away. Uh, in the end, Dunmore ends up retreating, and he goes to a ship, and that's the last time a royal governor would set foot on Virginia soil. And this, the Battle of Great Bridge, is the first major battle of the Revolution on Virginia soil. It's an absolute victory for William Woodford. As I said, Dunmore leaves, and never again would the British make a law in Virginia. Uh, Woodford actually publishes something in the paper a few days later. Now, between his notes and Dunmore's notes, it's not entirely sure how many casualties were taken by the British, but it's certainly, it's somewhere between 60 and 100 men were casualties during the Battle of Great Bridge for the British. For the Patriots, one guy got a wound on his thumb. That's a pretty overwhelming victory. Now, Woodford actually publishes in the paper about his victory, <laughs> bragging about all this, which is something you should do if you're, if you're a champion. You tell the world. <laughs> um, so Woodford does this. Uh, he actually calls it in that article uh, a second Bunker Hill, which is... Uh, I don't know. A hard comparison. It's similar to Bunker Hill, where they were just killing off the British while they were coming up the mountain, but the British end up winning Bunker Hill at great losses, but still winning. Uh, either way, promoting himself works, uh, though we're going to get to that. So just after the Battle of Great Bridge, Major General in the Continental Army, Robert Howe, shows up and essentially takes over because though the militias were in charge in their own state, the going rate was to default the Continental Army, except in the Carolinas and Georgia. That's a different story, as Robert Howe would find out. I see my conversation this week uh, uh, with, or coming up next week with Michael Troy about Robert Howe for more on that. Um, anyway, the uh, Robert Howe shows up 
they're defaulting to the British Army. It was like, uh, the British Army, the militias generally defaulted to the Continental Army. They all agreed to join one Continental Army. George Washington's in charge, especially in Virginia. They're going to do what Washington wants. So they're doing what Washington wants and defaulting to Robert Howe. But Robert Howe respects Woodford, just not only as a person, but because of this great victory he just had. Now, I mentioned before, on his way out, Governor Dunmore had burned a bunch of Patriot houses in Norfolk. He then ran to a ship and was on a ship. And they were just bombarding the town with cannon, cannon fire. Pretty consistently. Pretty randomly. Just firing cannons on the town. So, they didn't want to stay there. Woodford and Howe just didn't want to hang around for, you know, cannon attacks. So they decided, uh, we're going to leave. But, if they just left, then Dunmore can come in and take anything he wants from that town. So the decision was made to finish what the British started and burn Norfolk to the ground. This, as you might imagine, was pretty controversial. It was the biggest city in probably, in my estimation, the most powerful soon-to-be state out of the 13 colonies. And they were like, we're going to just burn it. <laughs> um, like I said, as you can imagine, people were upset about this. Now, uh, most people involved with the army and leading the, the future country, because it's 1775, most people involved with that were understood as a military strategy why that was necessary but it didn't win a whole lot so a lot of hearts or minds that being said woodford then takes his regiment the second virginia regiment goes up to join washington in new jersey and at this point they are assumed into the continental army about a year later uh william woodford is promoted from colonel to brigadier general he is a brigadier general in the continental army uh he serves excuse me, uh, in this position for a few years. Uh, he serves at Brandywine and Monmouth. He's actually injured at Brandywine, but still gets up and is able to continue uh, and fight at Monmouth not long after. And I apologize, it's after Monmouth and his efforts there that he's promoted to Brigadier General. Um, he's then sent back to the South to participate in the defense of Charleston. Uh, he rejoins with his buddy Robert Howe, uh, who had just lost Savannah. Uh, now, actually, let me take that back. Robert Howe was replaced before Savannah, but his replacement didn't make it until after Savannah. I'm sorry for that confusion. I don't want to lie to you. Um, either way, he goes to take over for help the takeover of Robert Howe's army and the Southern Department. He goes to help defend Charleston. Charleston is a disaster. It's the greatest loss for the Americans in the war. It's not the most famous loss in the war. The Americans lose, I think it's something like 5,000 troops, which might not sound like a lot to us in modern day, but that was a huge chunk. It was the whole Southern army was taken captive. And with them was William Woodford. Now what's very interesting is Woodford is brought with the, a, a portion of these. Most people captured at, Savannah, at Charleston, like Savannah, were brought to St. Augustine, Florida and held as prisoners. Woodford was actually brought away from the army and brought to New York City and held in a prison ship off New York City. Now, he was a brigadier general. Usually, officers were treated better in... in it is a, amazing that he is put on a prison ship at all and not at least put in the sugar house, which was pretty much just as bad. And Woodford is then... Uh, unfortunately, he's on this British prison ship for about seven months. And he dies there. He's still a young man. He's in his early 40s. But, well, uh, I'm sorry, 46. But we'll never know exactly what kills him. It's likely it was a combination of malnutrition and disease. That's killed just hundreds, if not thousands, of American soldiers on the British prison ship. That story of William Woodford ended on a bummer. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, was he also in the Battle of Kettle Creek in Wilkes County, Georgia? I don't know. Kettle Creek, is that a battle or is that a skirmish? <laughs> That's a great question. I'll be honest, I don't know the answer off the top of my head. I can pop up and look up a little bit about Kettle Creek. Uh, Kettle Creek, I don't believe he makes it down to Georgia. Like I said, he went down to Charleston. I don't think he actually makes it to Kettle Creek, but I will pull up who the commanders are. Um, Andrew Pickens. Oh, okay. Andrew Pickens, leader. John Dewey, I don't know a lot about, and Elijah Clark. Oh, is that the one where John Dooley disobeys his uh, lieutenant, or his colonel, and then wins the battle because he disobeyed? 
Interesting. David, yeah, it's a skirmish man. <laughs> uh, uh, to be fair, uh, when I pulled it up, it's listed as Battle of Kettle Creek. Uh, 40 killed. I don't see what the numbers are. I just popped up Wikipedia, which I know is not a great place to do research, but when you're trying to get something on the fly, usually they're pretty good about who the leaders are. And yeah, 700 versus 400. Mm, skirmish. <laughs> uh, no, I don't believe it's here. His name... Uh, he was a brigadier general. He would have popped up with with immediately if he was there as a as a leader. Um, because was Perkins even? I think Perkins was just in the South Carolina militia. So I don't I don't yeah I don't know if the Continental Army actually even made it there. Anyway, uh, great. You, oh, you live near the oh very cool. Well then you tell me. <laughs> uh, we well, one of the fun things about here is is when when we're when I have a question, oftentimes someone will uh, look it up while we're chit chatting and and pop it up there. Yeah, go go when you have a chance. Take some pictures, send them over to us. Uh, I forgot to put the link in the description. We have a Discord channel which I am trying to update pretty constantly. Uh, I will pop up the invite people link here. Copy. Uh, if you are here, I'm pasting it right now. Uh, if you're interested, if you're not familiar, Discord is an app. It's kind of like a social media app, but we get our own server. So it's just a founder of the day social media. Well, that sounds better than it is. You can go make your own <laughs> for free. It's not that big a deal, but it is pretty cool. Uh, it's also secure for us. Um, I'm also starting something. I haven't added it yet, but we started yesterday talking about uh, uh, doing read-alongs, as I'm going to call them. Uh, where, as I mentioned before, I'll pop up an article. I'll put a link in the description for you to read along with me. Uh, we can do literally any document from the time we can read along with. I started yesterday and we're going to do it. Uh, we're going to finish this in about uh, about two or three minutes. I'm going to take a break for about 15 minutes. Got to make some changes in my software. Uh, go take a drink. And then uh, um, uh, we're going to finish that up. It's, it's William Pierce's sketches of the delegates to the Constitutional Convention. Uh, or as he calls it, the Federal Convention. William Pierce doesn't stay long. He leaves almost right away. He's got a duel to fight. But uh, his sketches are really informative, and it's fun, and it's a good place to start. So we're going to do that uh, for the rest of you who are new here. Uh, when I end this particular episode, we've come up with these a long time, well, probably over a year ago. Uh, I end with the name of one of George Washington's properties that he sold in the Ohio Valley uh, called Round Bottom because it was funny to us when we read that, <laughs> and it stuck. Uh, also, David, you're new here. Anyone else watching new here? On Fridays, we play trivia. Uh, I put out pre-recorded videos every day, as I said, every day of the week with the, uh, with the article of the founder that I'm, I'm promoting that day, and uh, pretty much it. I add long-form content from here uh, every once in a while. I've started doing more live videos. That's what the read-along is. Uh, I understand people watch live really like to participate and be a part of it. And I feel like the read-alongs are a good way for us to study together. Uh, I can use my experience translating old-timey language to help you guys out uh, in understanding it when you're reading it. And if you guys come across something fun, there it is. And if we come, as I said, if we come across something I don't know, one of you guys can look it up and fill us in. So uh, thank you for watching. It's been a blast. I, I do very genuinely uh, apologize for the technical errors. Again, I'm doing literally exactly the same thing I always do, so I don't know why it's a problem today. Although I did see on my community Facebook page some people were having some problems with their internet earlier, but I haven't. I don't know. Um, so I'm going to go. I will be back in probably about 15 minutes. Uh, so thank you so much. David, I'm glad you came across me too. So welcome to the team. Uh, I'm going to go. Uh, like I said, uh, hit the notification, subscribe and hit the notification bell. Hit like if you haven't hit like. There's more people here right now than like. So hit like. That's the best thing you could do to help me get to more people and teach more people about the revolution. And uh, definitely hit the notification bell so it'll let you know when I go live in about 15 minutes uh, and we finish talking about characters of the revolution. I'm Jason. Thank you so much for watching. And uh, round bottom.